All right, guys, bang, bang. I'm super excited about this. Got Phil here. Uh, thanks for doing this, man. Oh, my pleasure. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. So I, I'm, I'm the one who's appreciative. Yeah. Uh, this is a, uh, going to be a little bit of a different episode because, uh, we're not going to spend so much time on, uh, on finance or, or business related stuff, but, uh, you just have a, a really cool story. And, uh, I think that we can make some, uh, some people, um, you know, get excited about walruses. So, uh, <laughs> maybe let's start with, uh, your background specifically. Um, and then we'll get into kind of the fun stuff, but just like, where'd you grow up and kind of what was early life like? I'm from a small uh, southern Ontario city called Welland in Canada, and uh, uh, not a particularly well-known uh, city other than may maybe stands out for being uh, rough, a little, little rough. So, you know, I sort of got my lumps there and uh, eventually graduated to the medium-sized uh, city uh, tourist trap of Niagara Falls, um, which is where I would... Uh, I would eventually find my uh, my employment at what was regarded as one of the more um, uh, noted tourism uh, places called Marineland. And uh, I don't know, maybe we should, if we want to back it up a little bit, I suppose I can speak to uh, what it is that led me to my employment at, at Marineland. But uh, there's really not much to say. I, I, I was sort of one of these, uh, I don't know, I guess... I didn't really know what it is that I wanted to do. Some people are born and they know they want to be chiropractors. I was born and I just knew I'd like to be outside and run around and, you know, sort of be a bit of a shit disturber and whatnot. So, you know, in all of my sort of, uh, in, in my, in my lost state of being, I sort of fell ass backwards into this job that, uh, you know, back then you looked in the want ads. And so I was looking in the want ads and I found a uh, Marine mammals assistant trainer's job. I thought, you know, it'd be a, probably an impossible job to get. But, uh, I, you know, I did go to school for, at the time, it was one of these six month programs, um, audio engineering and uh, multimedia post-production, it was called back then. And in 2000, cost me a lot of money. And about eight months later, it was a free download on the internet, all of the software that I learned on. But uh, nonetheless, it, Marineland found that attractive on my resume. So, you know, whereas I thought I was uh, not qualified for such a job, they, they thought, you know, we can, we can use you in house to do some of the music production and work on the equipment. And then, you know, you, you seem to like animals. So this would be a fit. And, you know, that was back in 2000. And uh, if we fast forward a little bit, uh, in 2012, I quit. Um, you know, it was a long time to, to, to work at Marineland. Of course, there's, you know, I did love animals, tough job to, to leave, but, uh, fast forward then some, and here we are, 2020, and I'm still being sued for $1.5 million for plotting to steal a walrus. And go. <laughs> All right, so hold on a second. Give us an understanding. For those that don't know uh, what Marine Land is, help people just understand kind of, you know, what is the organization, and then what does that actually look like on the ground? So, um you know, Marineland's been around a long time in Canada. It's, it's actually one of its uh, success stories. Uh, an, an immigrant had come to Canada with uh, a little more than a shirt on his back. And uh, by the name of John Holder uh, was, his, was the founder's name. He recently passed away a couple years ago. Uh, but nonetheless, he built this place from the ground up, um, you know, with little or no help from anybody. It's, it's really quite, an, it's quite a success story. Uh, the unfortunate fact, uh, matter of fact, is the, the, the style of business that he uh, created is not one that is, you know, in 2000, it doesn't have a place in 2020. So the man started with a, with a welding a cage and, and bringing in some sea lions, and then eventually that graduated to uh, larger land animals. He's, he, he began to expand his business. Uh, he basically had a massive zoo, and then he found his, his niche, which were uh, whales. And so much like SeaWorld in the States, it's uh, Marine Land is just a place where you pay money to go watch whales and dolphins and walruses and sea lions perform uh, to music. And, and in 2012, and, and quite frankly, up until, or in 2000 and, and up until 2012, uh, this was a celebrated industry. You know, it really was. It was a thriving, burgeoning uh, business, but, you know, not so much today. For sure. And so while you were there, like, what did you see? Um, and was this like immediate from, from when you got started or, or did it take some time for you to kind of get a lay of the land? Um, and what did you see that just kind of, you know, really put you off, I guess? 
So I would say the first thing, the first day that I showed up, I, I was completely put off. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I mean, I, I found the facilities to be awful. And I mean, frankly, I thought the animals were sad, but then I didn't want to be uh, anthropomorphic. I, I mean, I didn't know nothing about whales. Um, so I didn't want to just attribute uh, these emotions to what appeared to be sadness to me. But, you know, these people that I was learning from seemed to have a grip of what was going on. And they seemed to know that, uh, you know, a thing or two about this. And this was a celebrated industry. So I didn't, I didn't want to question much, especially in my like earliest of tenures, you know, earliest of days. I was just a 22 year old kid. I'm not going to chime in. I mean, sure, I had questions, but it was evident that people weren't there. The people there weren't asking a lot of questions. So on day one, it was kind of tough. Day two, day three, day four, day five, you become yourself desensitized to you, to your environment. <clears throat> year six, year seven, you become an apologist for it, or rather you, you, rather you, uh, you, you even defend it. Um, but then year eight, nine, 10, as you climb the, the ladder and you become closer to the decision makers and you yourself uh, are, are supposed to lend your thoughts <clears throat> and experience the decision making. I was always in the corner of the animals. And uh, so uh, my clash came with management. And for me, the, the bewilderment came when, you know, things that seemed so obvious were just being refuted in, in, in lieu of things that were more profitable or, or perhaps just not someone else's idea. It, it, the thing about Marine Land is it really is a, a place that is unique onto itself in how it was managed, it's kind of micromanaged by its founder. Not a lot of things happened without him having to know. And the problem with that is, you know, if he's not available and something is, you need some imminent attention, whether it be mechanical failures or, or animal and animals in distress, it could make for a, a very stressful environment. Like what would be an example where you're saying, you know, hey, look, the, the trade-off was, uh, in your opinion, obvious, but maybe they, they didn't agree? Well, for instance, I found that uh, you can get a lot more out of an animal if you can train them over a long period of time, establish their trust, and that would require a lot more time with the animal, uh, like hands-on, a lot more staff and whatnot. Let's, uh, let's use a medical training, uh, medical uh, procedures as an example. Rather than, than drop an entire pool of water down to inches and have, say, uh, 13 to 20 beluga whales on their stomach bouncing and thrashing and cutting themselves up and bleeding profusely and, and trainers getting injured because we're trying to do injections or trying to draw blood, why not train those animals to voluntary, voluntarily do so, which is totally possible. Uh, this would be a, a, an example of clash for me. So I would say to the management, look, it would just take me some time and investment, but we can do this and it's going to be, you know, it's going to have less impact on both trainers and animals. And they saw it as, well, we can get it all done in an hour and cost us maybe s some monies in medication and whatnot. But, you know, they just, things of that nature, things of that nature. Got it. And, and then uh, at what point does uh, Smushy come into, uh, come into the picture. So suddenly uh, there's rumor that we're gonna get these wild walruses and at Marine Land we never had walruses before. But you never knew what was coming. I mean, there was just days where you'd show up to work and you'd have some new wild caught dolphins in your possession. I mean, this was, you just never knew. So uh, the rumors proved, uh, proved fact. And uh, one day we, we received uh, two baby walruses. Uh, it wasn't in fact Smooshy yet, but these, these were our first two. And, uh, then came uh, multiple shipments of multiple more. Uh, some would die fairly immediately and then be replaced. Um, Where are they coming uh, from? Are, are they coming, like people are capturing them in the wild? Yeah, they're minutes? being captured in Russia. Everything you read in the news with, with regards to uh, marine mammals uh, and whale captures, uh, it, it's coming out of Russia. There's a, there's a burgeoning market in China and Russia is trying to fuel that market. So in China, they're erecting new uh, facilities left, right, and center, and they're buying these wild-caught uh, uh, orcas and beluga whales and, and walruses, in fact, from uh, Russian brokers. Uh, you may have, have, have uh, saw in the news last year there was a massive whale rescue where, uh, you know, in excess of 100 belugas and, uh, and orcas were, were forced to be released by the Russian government after activists um, sort of uh, uh, revealed that they were staying in this crazy prison. So, you know, for a while it was, it was global news. So, um, you know, it was, it was, it was quite an impactful, uh, impactful time, but nonetheless, 
the relationship that we had with the Russians is that if we got beluga whales or, uh, or, or walruses, if one were to die within, I don't know the period of time, it would just, I, I just recognized it as pattern, uh, another would come back as replacements. It was kind of a strange, weird thing. In fact, I mean, I, I'll keep the story short, but I, did, I first quit my job over a baby walrus that was imported. And I, I saw this baby walrus I, and I thought, Jesus, this, has, this animal has no, we should not be in possession of this animal. It's, uh, it's half dead. It's scared out of its mind. Every time we go near it to try to treat it medically, it, it looks like it's damn near gonna die from shock. I was, just, I was just so disillusioned by it, so I quit. And then the next day I felt just absolutely awful for having abandoned my teammates. Uh, because you know, it, you form bonds in these weird uh, environments uh, with the people you work with. And so I came back and, uh, <laughs> and volunteered in fact to, to uh, do the necropsy on the baby uh, walrus. And so the veterinarian said, I'm sorry. Oh, what's a necropsy? Yeah. That's it's the same as a as an autopsy for a human. You're just gonna you're gonna you know you're gonna find you're gonna go through the the organs and, and draw blood and different you know get samples of different things. And so what the veterinarian wanted uh, was just a, just a sample of the baby uh, walrus's brain. And so there I was with a chisel and hammer, and I felt like, look, I'll volunteer myself for this because I sort of a, a, a sign of I don't know I guess a form of weird punishment, but I felt like you know what if I'm, I I should do this. And so I did, and it was, you know, weird and awful things, but nonetheless, I, I, we went off topic. As far as Smooshy is concerned, so, so suddenly this, this walrus comes in to our possession, and uh, one day, you know, every time we get uh, green animals, as we call them, so wild caught, they're just untrained, uh, because they don't voluntarily present their uh, tails or whatnot to, to draw blood from, uh, you have to physically uh, sort of sort of manhandle them and, and tackle them to, to get blood so that you can do an initial uh, health assessment. And so in the process of doing that, we were sort of wrestling down uh, one walrus. Well, Smooshy was, was just had become frantic and, and uh, you know, walruses are just, are, are protected by nature. And she's trying to protect the other walrus that we were trying to get the blood from. And so she was so disruptive that I, I just decided to break away from the group and try to get her out of there. She was, you know, she was about 200 pounds at the time, which may not seem like yeah, it's you know it's a, it's a it's a hell of a thing to wrestle. So I was trying to wrestle her away, but something happened in that moment between the interaction of Smooshy and I that scientists have described it as an imprinting. So her brain circuitry opened. Suddenly, everything that I am is now tattooed on her brain, much like in the wild when a uh, herd animal. So let's use walruses in, as an example. Uh, are amongst thousands. The mother and, and calf are able to identify each other amongst all the noise and chaos because of an imprinting. So all of my senses, everything that I am, so my smell, the, uh, the sound of my voice, everything, it imprinted on her. So she recognized me suddenly as her mother. So you can imagine the, how conflicting this would be for someone like me who, you know, while I like the job, I also, as you know, as things, as things become more and more difficult, find myself in a situation where I've got a relationship with an animal that is, and this is going to sound crazy, but you know, I have a maternal like relationship. I, it's a very powerful thing and it's a strange thing for me to have to describe, but she sees me as her mother. And consequently, you know, I sort of, I raised her in ways and we had a level of communication that is unique to human and animals. We communicate differently. She, she's like, uh, she's family to me. It's, it's a strange thing to say, I know, but you have to understand where I'm coming from. It, it, explain what you mean by that, right? When people hear that, they're going to be like, that's crazy. But like, what, like, like, actually explain when you say that the way that you communicate with an animal uh, when you have that close bond, like, like, what exactly does that mean? She understands my sense of humor. I've had other animals that understand me in my, in sort of my mannerisms and, you know, if I elevate my voice, then they think, okay, it's like a heightened state of emotion. There's a response from an animal. In Smooshy's case, she knows when I'm kidding. She knows she, <laughs> just something that happens when an animal is protective of you as well. Like uh, the best, I guess a good example would be, how much do you love your dog for those who, who have dogs that are really, really, really those loyal and protective ones? They become family members. Well, in the case of Smooshy, it was more than that. She, actually saw me as her mom like a natural phenomenon just by virtue of that it just does something 
so yeah, we just have a greater level of communication and understanding. She, she we, we understand each other better. I know it sounds crazy. It's nonverbal, of course. I'm not saying when she says, oof, oof, I'm like, see, that means mommy. I'm saying like, you know, you can understand an animal's level of, uh, you know, any the animals that, that experience, that we perceive experience in, in emotion. I mean, it's, it's a tough place to venture into, but I mean, I, t I lean more towards, there's no question about it. When they're heightened, you understand it. And, you know, you can appreciate whether they're experiencing fear or whether they're experiencing excitement and whatnot. But with Smooshy, it, it just was so much more acute. For sure. And I guess as, um, as you were kind of going through this and building this bond, um, is it something where like you're in charge of just this one animal or are you still caring for uh, multiple animals, not just walruses, but, but other types of species as well? And it was just this one you had the close bond with. Right. So what I, what I did fail to mention in that is when, when I was mentioned earlier that walruses were coming in in various states of health, Smooshy came in and wasn't well. And so my first maybe month or so was dedicated to her because she had imprinted on me. My days were spent quite literally sleeping next to her while she was resting and getting her medication and just getting her strength up and whatnot. So initially I did spend a lot of time. Um, but of course I got to stretch myself a little bit thin too, because I've got literally another hundred animals to work with. And you know, you work in an environment where we're already stretched thin, especially in the winter where Marine Line is actually closed to the public. So, you know, staffing re uh, gets reduced and whatnot, but uh, you know, it's, it doesn't always go over well with the coworkers. One guy gets to sleep all day and the other one's got a scrubbed shit off bars. So, I mean, it is what it is. We got through it. Um, is this now, would it be fair to say like a lot of people have probably watched uh, Tiger King, the, the recent mm -hmm. Netflix documentary. And in that there's a number of scenes where uh, they have the tiger cubs and there's a human taking care of it. And obviously that uh, tiger cub learns to recognize that human uh, kind of understands that, Hey, they took care of me. And, and I'll call it, they're kind of friends to some degree. And as they get bigger and bigger, next thing you know, you know, you got a tiger that's 400 pounds and it's still, treating this human as if, uh, you know, hey, this is my friend, right? It doesn't attack it. It, it, it kind of uh, plays with it. It's responsive to it, et cetera. It sounds like a lot of what you're talking about here is that early bond that you have then translates to kind of the walrus version of that relationship, right? No, the difference between my relationship with Smooshy and that of an animal that a wild animal is just familiar with the language of training, which is you do good, I feed you. I mean, that's a symbiotic relationship. As long as you don't turn your back on these animals over time, it should, you know, you should keep all your limbs. But no, Smooshy, that imprint is a completely different thing. That's where if she's not literally beside me, I mean, at this moment right now, she is thinking about me. I know it sounds crazy, but she is, it's a, it's a level of obsession that I've never known. And now I actually was able, or rather then I was able to relate to the other animals because now I better understood what it meant for them to be torn apart from their family members and taken into captivity because I recognized the inherent fear and the thing that made animals in captivity different than those of the wild. But with Smooshy, because by virtue of being close to me in proximity, she didn't have that same sort of, you know, because I was, I filled the void of that missing uh, 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 mother and that bond that this world sort of became normal to her. It's a weird thing to explain, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not the same uh, relationship as uh, as someone that feeds an animal or works with an animal a lot. It's uh, well beyond that. It's almost inexplicable. It's she she genuinely thinks I'm her mom. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and and so at what point uh, do you kind of get fed up? Uh, on the marine land side and you're like hey I got to make a change here so I was conscious enough that the relationship with Smooshy was such that if I were to leave it was going to compromise her health so I did my best in at least the last year or so to try to wean off her dependence uh, from me because there was a there was a dependence but you know we did work that off and I was always conscious of not leaving until that was something that I was comfortable with. It was kind of, you know, I was always balancing that. But then in uh, 2012, 
at the end of our operating season, so let's call it August, there was a, there was a breakdown in the water disinfection unit. A ozone generator is what the, the machine's called. It generates ozone. And ozone, when worked in conjunction with chlorine, uh, mitigates uh, chlorine's use. You don't have to use so much. And so the idea is in conjunction, you keep your water clean. You don't have to use so much chlorine. The animals don't have the adverse effects because chlorine is, as I'm sure you can relate, you know, anytime you've ever jumped into a pool that was shocked and you didn't know, uh, you know, it can be awful. So animals living in that 24 seven, it's, it's an awful thing. So, you know, we started to call the founding, you know, the, the owner, John Holder, and would say, listen, the uh, ozone generator's broken, water's gone green. Uh, we got to get something done here. I, I can't rationalize his decision making, but I'll assume that, you know, because the season was closing, it was, was you know, it wrapped up in September, that, uh, or rather in October, that uh, this was something that could be put off because the park would be closed for a number of months and it could just be addressed then. The problem with that was the water had gotten so bad. I mean, it was, it was, it was evident. Uh, I mean, the water had gone completely green and I mean, we can go into the details that, you know, there, there is some evidence on the internet. So I encourage everyone as usual to do some, some research, but um, he just wasn't going to fix it. It just, we couldn't get him, you know, I would see him at local Tim Hortons coffee shops and I've got animals whose eyes are bleeding. And uh, his only answer the answer, rather, was to increase chlorine use over the months that we were closed, and uh, it was awful. It was awful. The, the effects were awful. And is that, a and so, is that a financial decision, or is it being driven by something else? I'll say it's financial in addition to the fact that some people can't be told what to do. And when too many people are emphatically trying to tell someone what to do, it just, some people just elect to not do that. I can't explain why. All I know is the complacency was unjustifiable. And so two weeks pr prior to the following season's opening day, I said, I ain't, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not part of Marine land anymore. I don't go on that stage. I don't bring animals in this condition. Oh, I don't do this no more. I'm fucking done. And so I insisted on an exit uh, meeting and, uh, you know, we exchanged unpleasantries and pleasantries, but I wouldn't have quit without the, uh, the firm agreement that I was to remain in Smooshie's life if she needed me, which historically she had. Marineland agreed so much so that even one week later, because after I'd quit Marineland's owner, after the exit, uh, meeting he very frantically dumped the water actually delayed the opening of the park but uh he got the message when i left um he called me back in to, to treat a dolphin because the dolphin stopped eating. as soon as you change a, a wild animal or, or captive animals environment they get a little bit spooked they stop eating so uh he had he like the owner specifically had me come in uh to give a a, a dolphin valium and because valium in the zoological settings or at least with marine mammals will stimulate appetite and so we, we, I administered the Valium and, uh, you know, she, she, she was bouncing back. I saw Smooshy. I was certain not to let Smooshy actually see me because I, I, you know, I'd been gone in, in excess of a week now and it's a pretty long time. So I didn't want to disrupt whatever progress they were having with her, but I did see her. Uh, and I left, but uh, it was about a month later that, uh, you know, I wasn't in the best place, frankly. I mean, I should emphasize that when I quit, it was also in the interest of my, of my mental health. I wasn't in the best of shape either. But uh, a month later, I just decided, you know what? It's been a month now. I'm going to go see Smooshy. And when I tried to get back into the park, for some reason, the security guard wouldn't let me in. It was the strangest thing because, oh, shit, man, I was like family over there. So uh, stroke of luck, the owner's son, who's a good friend of mine, happened, happened to see the interaction with me and the security guard. And, uh, you know, he escorted me in. Well, while I was coming into the park, one of the veterinarians drove around the back and she, she, you know, she met up with me. So she already got, she'd been tipped off that I was there. I said, what the hell's going on? And she said, you're not going to like what, you, what you're going to see. I said, let's go. And so she took me to the back in what's called the warehouse or the barn and uh, took me immediately to go see Smooshy. And there she was, emaciated, uh, you know, bone dry. 
Uh, there was no fresh water. There was no ice on her deck. I mean, it looked awful. I was, so, you know, as soon as she recognized me, she perks up. I said to the vet, <laughs> imagine this. I said, go get meds. So she, she's running. Now we're filling fish with, you know, various meds. We start feeding her the meds, get her to drink some water, whatnot. <clears throat> and as I'm leaving, you know, I said to the vet, the fuck happened? Why didn't you call me? And evidently, the last time I was brought in to feed the dolphin, it irked one of the new managers. He didn't like that the, uh, that the owner had gone over his head and called me specifically. So it's it quite political. But nonetheless, it was determined that yeah, Phil doesn't come here anymore. Here's the new chain of command of, how, of who calls Phil. And it was just sort of decided that Phil wasn't going to be called anymore. And so I saw that. And uh, what I didn't mention is at the time, some newspapers had been calling me because you know, back in 2008, when Smooshy showed up, there was quite a bit of media attention around she and I's relationship. Uh, there was a fluff story that came out on uh, on uh, Valentine's Day, and it was picked up by a bunch of media. In fact, I was on like Jimmy Kimmel show, Inside Edition. It went crazy at the time when viral was yet to, you know, was yet a thing. I was becoming MySpace viral, let's say. So, uh, you know, by virtue of having had that attention and now quitting, much of the media was like, you know, you know, where's the walrus guy going? What the fuck's happened? I was actually quoted in a 2008 article saying, if I ever quit, I'm going to take this walrus with me, which, uh, you know, Marilyn has yet to present as, as evidence in court, but nonetheless, <laughs> if I can help their case, any, <laughs> their, their non-existing case, any. but uh, yeah, they started to call me and ask me why I quit and everything. And, you know, because my relationship with Marine land was still firm and I intended to keep it as such, I, I didn't talk, but uh, after seeing Smooshy in the condition that she was, you know, I picked up the phone and I said, you put my fucking name, my face on every fucking newspaper and I could hear the print machines going back. Okay, Phil, let's fucking go. Buckle up. Okay, let's do this. And so, you know, massive expose happened to drop on the owner's birthday. Um, you know, things just got really ugly. So they sued me. And so in that expose, like what were the main allegations or, uh, or kind of claims, if you will? Well, of note, I wasn't the only whistleblower. There were seven of us initially that grew to 15, and then it grew in excess of, many of which elected to speak anonymously because for fear of legal reprisal because Marine Land is uh, litigious just by, uh, they have a long litigious history. So, it, you know, it, des it described everything from lack of staff issues to, uh, you know, the water breakdown. Uh, there was incidences where the owner was shooting neighbors' dogs. I mean, it, it really quite just became an expose surround, uh, around just a lot of uh, animal abuse sort of uh, revelations and whatnot. Just, I mean, Marine Land's always had a history, but, you know, 2013, 2014, with things like Twitter and whatnot, it just, the landscape changed for the little guy. And so whereas they were accustomed to just absolutely chopping everyone down, you know, here I am just you know, luckily sustaining, but, you know, they just, they, 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 they employed their strong arm, their corporate strong arm, and, and they sued me with a slap suit. Uh, and a slap suit, for those who don't, who, who aren't familiar, uh, the SLAP acronym stands for Strategic Lawsuit Against Public Participation. Uh, basically, they sue me to shut me up so that the public doesn't get interested in what the hell it is I have to say. And the, cha and the imminent change that would come with it. And so I'm assuming that you thought that this might happen, but do you remember when you first heard that the lawsuit had actually been filed? Like what your reaction <laughs> was? This was great. Uh, I thought it could happen, but I'd, I'd had enough people in my corner uh, naively, <laughs> naively telling me that, well, if you're telling the truth, you can't be sued. Well, that's not necessarily true. Uh, you, you, you were unlikely to get a, a to get any type of verdict against you, but you can certainly be sued. Uh, so I had the sense that, you know, maybe they would, but I, you know, I, I don't know, I wasn't yet convinced, but uh, suddenly I started getting um, calls from a friend of mine saying, Let's, look, man, they're gonna serve me. They're threatening. I just got, you know, I got served with this cease and desist. I got all this stuff. They're gonna sue me tomorrow. And he's calling me and telling me all this stuff. I'm like, what? Like, That's crazy, man. The next day they sued me, <laughs> fuckers. <laughs> and I found out by watching the news, my friend literally texted me, it's not me, it's you, in capital letters. I look, what the hell? 
and then I see that I'd missed a couple calls from a, from a journalist. <laughs> the funny thing is, you know, you learn a thing or two about journalism and all of this as well. In journalism, at least back then, super corporate friendly journalism, you know, you take a lawsuit and you, take a, you, you create all the greatest headlines from it that you can because a lawsuit is literally a legal means to defame the shit out of somebody because all you have to do is, you know, I sue you for anything and the newspaper could grab it, run with the headlines and just say, you know, it's, and these allegations have yet to be proven in court. So a corporate friendly media will take, uh, will take something that's been handed to them before I'm even served, imagine that. Take the, uh, sort of take the details of it, probably tip on what, on, on, on what aspects to point to. And uh, they call me one time, let it ring twice, hang up. Phil was unavailable at time for comment. All they have to do is send you an email. And if you don't respond to that email within two minutes and then they do that one call with two rings, it was, it was absolutely ridiculous. I found out I was being sued in the media. I was learning about it on the news. It's crazy. And so at what point are you like, all right, I should go steal a walrus? So the allegations of my plotting to steal a walrus uh, were in the lawsuit. I will say that they were there basically to make me look like a crazy idiot and that they could run with stupid headlines because back in maybe the 90s, that would work. Maybe in the 80s, that would, let's say in the 80s, that would definitely work. Uh, but in 2012, it just wasn't going to take. So the, the idea that I would ever have plotted to steal a walrus is absurd. But I should mention that by virtue of being sued for millions of dollars and now having sustained many years of litigation uh, through public support and, and uh, whatnot, because, you know, there's a number of campaigns here, people that, you know, you might not necessarily be an animal lover, but you might be like, you know, fuck the man. You might be like, you know what, give this, you know, keep this guy fighting because I don't know. I, I, there's, <laughs> It's nice to have a lot of support. And there's certainly a lot of reasons to keep this thing going as best and as long as we can. But that lawsuit, they, they fucked up. And the problem is with lawsuits is there's settlements. And, uh, you know, a, there's a good and evil aspect to this. But there's also an asshole versus asshole aspect. And, you know, there was, there was a big asshole in all this. And then there's, there's me who is who might wind up being the bigger asshole because I'm a hard negotiator. There's, the only, there's only one thing I want. So you can call it plotting to steal a walrus or not, but I didn't sue myself. But if they, want, if they want to get away from this lawsuit, there's only one way. Give me the fuck a walrus. I know it sounds crazy. Give me the fuck a walrus. All right, hold on, hold on. So the only way that you want to settle this is if they give you smooshy. What the hell are you going to do with a walrus? I have a place that's going to build a facility. We'll be ready in a matter of months that is local, that will have two other walruses, uh, young females, so there's no, uh, no concern for, for aggression or, or mating and whatnot. And uh, they have, uh, they've declared themselves interested. And so Marineland has, I mean, the unfortunate part about lawsuits, litigation, and settlement talks is, you know, there's an element of good faith in negotiations. But let's just say... Uh, I can't make it easier for Marineland. So it just becomes a question. And, you know, Mer Smooshy is the last surviving walrus, I should mention. In the last two years, well, now, now two and a little, uh, four have died. I mean, whatever is happening at Marineland right now, and, and it and has forever, but it's just been exacerbated. The animals are dying off very quickly. It's very concerning. Um, Marineland's conscious choice to keep Smooshy at the park is a conscious choice to keep her in a state of torture as far as I'm concerned. And so I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for Marineland. And, uh, you know, by virtue of it's going to be, it's going to, it's been costing them. And this is my emphasis to them is whereas they say something to the effect of, well, walruses are very valuable. I say, well, not a walrus is costing you tens of millions of dollars. And I can with confidence say that over the eight years I've been removed tens of millions. And so like part of what I don't understand, right, is like the math and business behind all of this. So what I mean by that is like when that walrus shows up uh, as a baby walrus uh, to Marine Land, like how much are they paying for it? And then what is the ongoing cost uh, just to feed it, shelter it and, and kind of take care of it? So I don't know the cost of a wild walrus. I can't even necessarily... I can't even offer what wild dolphins or, or belugas cost. I just, 
I don't want to be wrong about it, and I don't, I, I just don't know. Well, but the but care is ball, on a ballpark basis. Are we talking uh, a couple thousand dollars or like half a million dollars per animal? If you had to guess, if I had to guess, I think if you're dealing with one beluga, you're in the near six figure range. But if you're dealing with multiple, then you're it may reduce the price a little bit. So, uh, you know, with Marine Line, we would get like six to 12 per shipment. Uh, I think four or five times we've got them, maybe more, a couple times before I'd gotten there. Uh, and dolphins, we'd received uh, three times, if I'm not mistaken, uh, walruses four times, often accompanied with other shipments. Uh, so I don't know because they were talking about like combo platters. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, and, and I'm but assuming that's what drives a lot of the big business in Russia and China as well, right? Is they're grabbing these uh, animals out of the oceans in the wild and then turning around and selling them for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in a market. Obviously, there's a huge profit margin there. Um, and, and so uh, I'm assuming that they're not putting them in the equivalent of Marine Land or SeaWorld in China. Maybe they are. Uh, but, but I've got to imagine that that's more food-based type, um, at, you know, financial activity rather than here in the U S a lot of that's going into, um, trying to build a business around, Hey, I buy this animal, I take care of it. And then I actually bring people into the park, uh, and have them, um, kind of watch shows and things like that. Right. The idea, at least with Marineland, their tried tested business model. And remember the owner, uh, was very was an older man. I mean, we're talking about an old school dude. Who's, this was his baby, so you can imagine why he wouldn't want to necessarily adopt any type of positive change or or evolve much. He almost he almost took the stance and even ramped up his purchasing of wild animals. But uh, yeah, it just it used to be a draw at the door. If you had an orca in a pool, you were going to make a lot of money. So it was worth paying at least a lot of money in medication. You'll notice, you know. Facilities in North America haven't changed, by the way. If you take a look at SeaWorld, you take a look at Marine Land, and you never notice that the pool, you don't hear of new large expanses. You just never do. New ride, yes, new this, but you know, it's an old school idea with no place in 2020. If, we, if today we were going to start and build, much like China is, these facilities, I don't know that, it, like, imagine if we were to start from scratch, we're going to say, hey, I've got this marvel idea. I'm going to take that majestic animal put in a cage everyone would be like no that's not happening it's just absolutely absurd a case couldn't be made for it and yet today and yet these facilities are they still exist and they're all like 30 and 40 years old but the pools haven't changed anything so you know they're still stuck in the idea that you fill the pools you fill the stands but you know legislation is catching up to them as well um canada uh, very proudly What's that, sir? Do you think we'll see them shut down, like Marine Land, Sea World? Do you think eventually they get shut down and outlawed, or uh, do you think that they'll just kind of morph what they look like? So what you'll see is they, they do have a shelf life, uh, just by virtue of animals having a shelf life. Uh, whatever whatever laws come around. So let's use in Canada, for example, uh, breeding, import, and export of whales, dolphins, and porpoises have been uh, outlawed. It's banned. It's a new law that was passed only a few months ago. Um, I'd like to thank Marineland for their help in, in helping me pass that law, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, by example, uh, Marineland now has to care for their fucking animals because they can't get any more. And so the same thing you can imagine is going to happen. I believe New York State has some laws. California has done the same. Um, I imagine maybe at the, at the federal level uh, in the states, I, 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 I mean, it's all going to catch up. But, you know, people vote with their dollars. That's the bottom line. And no one wants to really go to these places. If you notice, uh, these facilities are really suffering. I mean, everyone's suffering right now, but back it up even just a mere, mere months ago. See, uh, CEOs, are, it's a rotating door at SeaWorld, CEO, because no one can come up with an idea to keep these things going. And any new ideas are immediately rejected because there's just an old guard that is unbreakable with this particular business. And like, you know, you mentioned Tiger King earlier because who doesn't? But, you know, these, these owners are really eccentric people. They just really are. It's across the board. I'm going to say it. I'm going to generalize the whole load of them. Zoo owners and aquarium owners are just some of the wackiest people I've ever come across, I have to say. So, uh, you know, nothing surprises me with the way, with all the, you know, hearing all the stories of litigation and Tiger King and everything else, it's like, yeah, exactly, of course. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy, man, when you start to see some of this stuff. Uh, one of the last things I want to talk about is um, you've done a, a number of really interesting uh, kind of fundraisers and, and things to uh, not only one fuel the uh, litigation that, that you're um, engaged in, but also on top of that, uh, to really bring awareness to 
um, a lot of these issues, and, and obviously Smooshy is, is one piece of that, but, but a broader issue as well. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about just how you've thought through um, kind of, you know, the critical thinking and outside the box thinking that's required to, um, you know, really kind of rise above the noise in a lot of these situations. So I will just go back to the day I decided to speak out. I was laying on my bed rocking back and forth in a fetal position. And I said to myself, hey, how am I supposed to live the remainder of my life if I don't do something here? Uh, what does the rest of my life look like? And how do I live with myself? I, I just couldn't, I couldn't conceive not, not doing something. And so by virtue of like, I, I, the way I say it is I, I gave myself up to the universe. What I said was, you know, no one stands a chance in this fight, me included. So if I've got nothing to lose, and I should mention that at the time I had just won uh, $50,000. <laughs> it sounds crazy. I, uh, everything I say sounds crazy. I, w I went on this, this reality TV show called Wipeout. You may be familiar. You remember the big red balls and all that stuff? Well, there was a, there was a short uh, lived version, Canadian version, and I was on it, the premiere episode, because I was the walrus mom and I won. So when I got that 50K, you know, I got it because the walrus. In my mind, I kept say, saying to myself, well, I wish I'd said to myself, buy Bitcoin, but <laughs> I'd said to myself, you know, it's not really my money. Like it's, uh, it's an easy thing to say, hey, go, go buy yourself something fancy or whatnot. But, you know, I was just in such a state of sort of uh, distress and everything was just sort of precarious situations at Marina. And I thought, you know, I better hold on to this for a rainy day. So I at least at the onset of the lawsuits and everything else and, and the decision making that went forward, I thought I've got 50 K this is my money to get out of the gates. We'll see how long this lasts. And if I can keep going, then I'll keep going. And so I, I, I started with the 50 and then, you know, launched some uh, various uh, uh, GoFundMe uh, campaigns and whatnot to sustain throughout. And, you know, I still have one. Uh, my dis oh, by the way, and just to back up, my decision moving forward and my state of mind of thinking outside the box was, was this. In every which possible decision presented, be the most costly and pain in the ass for Marine Land that I can be. In every which way. And the unfortunate part of that is that I have to give myself away often. I always have to play the, the role of this bravado guy while, my, while I'm filling my pants. But, you know, I just, I just decided... Do the exact thing that scares the shit out of you the most. And it's exactly what I've done. And I have, I have been, I've gone broke three times. I've been on the edge of absolute disaster. I've gone, I mean, still maybe crazy, but still sustaining and somehow, and it is truly in the belief that, you know, if I just keep, do, if I just keep fighting, I, I mean, I've got nothing to lose anymore anyway. So... I do have a website, a, a fundraising website. It's uh, at savesmooshy.com. I'll spell it out, S-A-V-E-S-M-O-O-S-H-I.com. Uh, there's a trailer on there to a documentary that's coming out. I've uh, been followed for the last, uh, in excess of two years, both uh, you know fighting for this legislation in Canada and my fight for Smooshy and whatnot. So uh, you know, and that, that's coming out on May 28th in Canada uh, on the CBC, which is our national broadcaster. Uh, and that's only because it was selected for the Hot Dogs, Hot Dogs uh, uh, International Documentary Film Festival, but, you know, it's been delayed and whatnot. So, so you know, uh, CBC partnered with, uh, with Hot Dogs. And so they're actually going to premiere it in Canada, but it is geolocked to Canada. But thereafter, I believe the plan is a theatrical run, maybe in the U.S. and then uh, U.S. distribution via, you know, whatever, whatever it is. So, you know, look out for that. What, what, do we put the, what do we put the odds at right now that, uh, let's say, by the end of 2021, you have Smooshy? What's the probability of that? There was a, I was at 1% when I quit. <laughs> if that, I was, on a, I was just on a – and right now, in my gut, I think – I mean, it, it's a question of her staying alive, but if she stays alive, if she stays alive, she will see me. I'm giving that a 99 percenter. Will I get her? I'm going to give it 51 percent in the next in the next six months. I'll know. Now, That's we are, you got well, a shot. 
we are oh shit yeah we got a shot i we're in a part of litigation right now that they don't want to be in so they have some really hard decisions to make i'm trying to make it as easy as possible but if they want to continue to embarrass themselves and cost themselves down the road then i'm 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 here to i'm here for that like i love it so do you think that anyone's told smooshy yet If I told you about my ayahuasca journey, <laughs> I told her. <laughs> I visited her. I breathed life into those nostrils. <laughs> I squeezed that heart. But I told her. She knows. I I'm love still it. here because of it. I love it. Um, all right. So for those that want to, uh, to figure out more about Smooshy, learn more about kind of the, uh, the bigger picture here of just, it really just comes down to animal cruelty and, and a lot of things that are, uh, you know, becoming more apparent and, and obvious that they're inhumane um, in the treatment of some of these animals. Uh, you can go to savesmooshy.com and it's a save and then S-M-O-O-S-H-I, correct? Correct.com. And also friends don't let friends go to Marineland and SeaWorld. So spread the word. Friends don't let friends go to SeaWorld or Marineland. I love it. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. And I think the next court appearance, you know, like the, the Marineland's lawyer will be listening to this and he will take issue. So whether I wear it or not, we'll see. You know, much of what I do is, again, just being a pain in the ass. But I got this new shirt I'm making called Lawyer Destroyer. I'm going to wear it under my butt shirt and at some point. I'm gonna... Or I'm not. Or I'm not. We'll see. If you go into a courtroom and you wear a shirt that says lawyer destroyer, there better be a video. <laughs> it's, my attire has been complained about in court before. Anyways, <laughs> much of what I do gets complained about in court, but it's not getting them very far. I love it. I love it. All right, Phil, listen, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Uh, you, you obviously have a, uh, a very different, but, um, but pretty crazy and, uh, and, and impressive story. So, um, I think that more people hopefully will, uh, will kind of look into this and, uh, you know, here in the United States, it's very obvious that, uh, th there's a lot of kind of animal cruelty at, um, at, at these, uh, you know, organizations and some of it's being addressed, some of it's not, but, uh, there's very few people who are willing to kind of dedicate their, uh, their time and energy to this. So, uh, for all the people who, uh, who love animals, thank you. Well, and I'm just appreciative for all the support, man. I got the best seat in the house. So I thank everyone. And you especially, man, every opportunity to, to spread word like this is, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's all I've got, you know, it really is. This is, it's me against, I'm against the machine. So I appreciate that, uh, that there is a machine for me to fall back on. The lawyer destroyer strikes again. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Phil. My pleasure, man. Anytime.